So to, to really understand the depth of what we just heard in the gospel passage, we have to go back a, a couple of weeks and look at the gospel that we heard, um, which is kind of a, a bookend to this gospel passage, because in both passages we hear about Jesus meeting somebody along the way. And uh, both of them having this profound um, in, in, in encounter with Jesus, but then going off two separate ways. And you may remember a couple weeks ago, the person who ran up to Jesus was the, uh, the, the young rich man. And in that uh, account, uh, this man who had many possessions ran up to Jesus and, and asked him, Lord, Rabbi, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You remember that? And Jesus tells him, he says, follow the commandments. And the young man says, well, I've done all that. And Jesus looks at him, and Mark tells us, loved him, and said, you just have one more thing to do. Go sell everything that you own and give the proceeds to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. And at that, Mark tells us that the rich young man went away very sad because he had many possessions. And we, we go back to that story and look at that one, because today we have this story of Bartimaeus, quite different from the rich young man, a poor, blind beggar. And yet Mark lays it out for us and tells us in, in no uncertain terms that Bartimaeus obviously is the one that we want to follow. And the choice indeed is ours. Which way do I want to go? And it's quite obvious, isn't it? Bartimaeus, he, he, we're, we're told, leaps up with joy and follows Jesus along the way. But there's that small little detail that Mark puts in there of including his name that really speaks uh, uh, to the importance of the decision that he made. It, it is a, a decision that resounds and that has long-term consequences. Bartimaeus is remembered by his name for the rest of human history. As long as Bibles are being printed or the Christian faith is being taught, we're going to know about Bartimaeus. Whereas the other man who didn't make such a good choice is known only by this description of his possessions, the rich young man. That is how he's described. That is his identity. So the choice is laid out there for all of us. Which, which way do I want to go? And obviously I want to follow Bartimaeus, but that can be a very difficult decision, can't it? When Jesus calls us, yes, yeah, sometimes he does ask us to leave some things behind, like he, le like he asked the, uh, the rich young man to do. You know, leave these things behind, these things that you're attached to. He promises us you're really not going to be lacking anything. And yet still, it can be difficult for us. But Mark wanted his audience to know that there was something really special going on here. And he doesn't do that simply by having us recall Bartimaeus' name. But there's a couple of other details in there that help us to know, that give us a little bit of peace of, of mind and heart to know that following Jesus really is the right choice. And one of those things simply is the name of Jesus. But his name is in connection to another detail that we hear in this gospel, is that Jesus was coming up from Jericho. So why is this significant? And what does this clue us into about, why, about how Bartimaeus was able to make this decision so, so easily, so freely? Well, the name of Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua, which is a, a, the translation of the name Joshua. So Jesus' name is really Joshua. If we were to translate it really literally, we call him Jesus. But his name was Joshua. And Joshua, as you may remember, was a character from the Old Testament who was uh, a, a friend of Moses, a companion on this exodus out of Egypt. And we know that the Israelite people were enslaved in Egypt for about 400 years or so until God looked down on them, saw their suffering, saw their enslavement, and called Moses and said, you're going to lead my people out of Egypt. So they, they leave Egypt, and they cross the Red Sea, and they're in the Sinai Desert, 
And one thing that I don't think we often realize is that they make it to the border of the promised land pretty quickly. Maybe only took a week or so to get there. But what happens is, as they're about to go in, Moses sends these 12 spies to go into the promised land to make sure everything is going to be okay when they get in there. And so the 12 spies, which included Joshua, go in and spy out the land for 40 days. And they come back, and they're so thrilled. They're so excited with what they've seen. The land is flowing with milk and honey. They bring some of the produce back. And they, they show them, look at the, all the fruit that's there waiting for us. There's only one caveat. The land is already inhabited. And the people who are living there already, they say they're formidable giants. And compared to them, we are like grasshoppers. So this sense of, of, de of despair, of, of anxiety... Uh, begins to set in amongst the Israelite community and they begin to grumble again and say why did you bring us out here you know just to die right as we're about to enter into the promised land and Joshua speaks up and he says don't be afraid the Lord is on our side all we have to do is listen to him and he will fight for us and he will deliver our enemies into our hands and the people, they don't, they don't trust Joshua. They don't believe. And so the Lord says, well, because of your lack of faith, you're going to wander in the desert now one year for every day that the spies spied out the land. For 40 years, you're going to wander in the desert. And that number 40 was significant because it was the amount of years that it took one generation to come about and die and another one to come forward. So the Lord is saying, I don't want this generation that was so fearful, that was so uh, doubtful to enter into the promised land. Their descendants, who know me from the beginning, are going to enter into the promised land. So 40 years go by, Moses dies outside of the promised land, and Joshua is the one who takes up his mission to be the leader, to lead the people over the Jordan River, where Jesus was baptized, into the promised land. And Joshua does this. Much like Moses parted the Red Sea, Joshua parts the Jordan River, the Ark of the Covenant goes through, God is leading them through, and they enter into the Promised Land. And the first city that they encounter, that they knew the people were there living before them, it's Jericho. So Joshua is instructed by the Lord. Again, this fear sets in. But the Lord tells Joshua, don't be afraid. What I want you to do is march around the walls of Jericho for six days. And on the seventh day, I want you and all the soldiers to blow your trumpets and the walls of Jericho are going to come tumbling down. And so that's exactly what they do. They march around Jericho for six days and on the seventh day, they blow their trumpets and boom, Jericho falls and the Israelites march through. And that began their campaign of pretty much picking off all of these little tribes that were living in uh, the Promised Land as they make their way through and begin to settle it for themselves. So now we hear this story about Jesus. And the audience at Mark's time, they hear, hear that name, they hear Joshua. And they hear Jesus coming up from Jericho. They're hearing, ah, perhaps there is a new campaign that is coming about. Perhaps there is this new victory that is going to be brought about. But Jesus told us that his, his kingdom indeed was coming, but his kingdom was not of this world. Right? He wasn't going to begin a military campaign to overthrow Caesar. He wasn't going to depose anybody with force. His kingdom was a kingdom of humility and of service. And so the people hearing this, especially uh, Bartimaeus, they're sensing that this is the new Joshua, and the time has come for Christ to lead us out of slavery, but not a physical slavery, but nonetheless the definitive freedom that God wants us to have. And that is the freedom uh, from sin, the freedom from these attachments, like the rich young man had. He was so attached to his possessions that he he refused an invitation from God. 
And likewise, the apostles from last week, James and John, they're so attached to power. They want to be in control that they lose sight of what is important as well. But it's Bartimaeus who gives us a prefiguration, a kind of foretaste of what Jesus is going to enact for us. He's going to heal us, not just on the outside, but from the inside. And he's going to give us that definitive peace and fulfillment and happiness that we have been desiring since the moment of our creation. The fulfillment and peace that God wanted to bestow upon the Israelites in bringing them out of Egypt into the freedom of the promised land. The freedom which comes from knowing God and being in relationship with God, being loved by God. And this is something that the saints, the saints knew, especially the saints who even lived amidst persecution, right? Even though there was, is still physical slavery going on in our world sometimes, the saints knew that they were free on the inside. And we celebrated a saint like this who knew this on Friday, Pope John Paul II. And he lived during a time of, of great idolatry, we can still call it, under the Nazi regime. He was from Poland, so he lived under the Nazi regime and the communist regime after the end of World War II. And that is the idolatry of human power, of human might. Humanity becomes God under those regimes. And he saw how devastating that could be. But Pope John Paul II recognized that human beings they're, they're, were craving for happiness, were craving fulfillment, but only Jesus Christ can give us this. And this is what he said. He said, it is Jesus that you seek when you dream of happiness. He is waiting for you when nothing else you find satisfies you. It is Jesus that you seek when you dream of happiness. And we're all dreaming of happiness, aren't we? We all want to be happy. That's what we're made for. But too often we go after things that really won't make us happy. Power, pleasure, prestige, possessions. But John Paul II said, it is Jesus who you dream of when you dream of being happy. And when all those things fail, don't worry. Jesus is there waiting for you to pick you up and to give you what you need. And John Paul II, he could say that definitively because he lived it. He experienced it himself. And having experienced that, living under those repressive, oppressive regimes, he knew that this was what he was called to give people as the pope, as a bishop, as a priest, was to introduce them and have them encounter Jesus Christ. And there's a story about Pope John Paul II I want to share with you. Uh, I think it's very, go, ties very closely together with the story we hear today about Bartimaeus, about this longing uh, for healing and for vision. And the story goes that there, you know, there's poor people living in Rome, and just like here in our city, and there was a group that was ministering to the, the poor people in one section, and they noticed that there was one gentleman there who never, ever spoke a word. He was so um, withdrawn into himself, so silent. But over time, after ministering to him for a while, they broke down his walls a little bit, and he spoke up, and, and he said something to them that they were not expecting. He said, I know your Pope. We were in the seminary together. And so the, the volunteers were astounded at, at this. And word got, got through the Vatican, all the way up back to Pope John Paul II, that there was this man who was begging, who was in the seminary and, and was actually ordained with at the same time. And the Pope recognized his name. And he said, yes, that's true. And so what he did is, much like Bartimaeus, he told his uh, advisors and his assistants to call the man. And he called the man and invited him to have dinner with him in the Vatican. And they did. And at the end of their meeting, at the end of their time together, the Pope asked if the man would go and have a, a, uh, a personal, private conversation with him. And when they went off together, it's, the story goes that the Pope asked this priest to hear his confession after all these years. And the priest hesitated, right? How, how could he return to that life after it had been squandered? 
and yet the Pope uh, prevailed on him, and he had his confession heard. And then, I'm not sure if this is uh, official, if this is uh, authentic, but then it, the story goes that the Pope said, now I will hear your confession. They left the room together, um, embracing each other, and not long after that, the man uh, resumed his, his ministry as a priest, as a chaplain in one of the nearby hospitals in Rome. It's the power of the invitation. The moral or the lesson for all of us is to ask our Lord for this kind of vision, which is, is threefold. And the first part of this vision is to see, as I said in the beginning, to see our sins, to know that we are broken, to know that we are fallen, but not in a you know, self-deprecating, being, being so hard on ourselves sort of way, but with great humility, right? We have to be able to acknowledge that I'm not perfect and that I'm not God. That's the first part, right? Much like Bartimaeus, who had the, the humility and the courage to call out to, to Jesus. Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. That's the first part of our vision that we ask for. Lord, help me to know my sins. The second part is then to know, as Bartimaeus knew, that Jesus is there to forgive us, that Jesus is there to heal us. And sometimes what happens in the spiritual life is we are more like the people who were with Bartimaeus, and we, rebu re we rebuke ourselves and say, just be quiet. Jesus doesn't want to have anything to do with you. After what you've done, kind of like the priest, who was so, so kind of withdrawn in on himself, so isolated, but this vision is always to see Jesus the way Jesus wants to be seen. And that is as the, as the good shepherd, as the one who is always knocking on the doors of our hearts, saying, let me in. And this is what Pope John Paul II said. He said, open wide the doors of, of your heart to Christ. He is waiting there for you when you realize that everything else you've looked for does not satisfy you. So, we see ourselves in our sins with humility, right? That's okay. We don't beat ourselves up, but we go to Christ because we see him as he is. He's our merciful and loving Savior, and he's inviting us. He's saying, come, come to me. And what happens after we experience that? The third part of the vision is then to see others the way that Jesus sees them. To see others the way that Pope John Paul II saw that man, not seeing his mistakes, not seeing his mess-ups, how he had squandered his life, but to see his potential, what he, could, what he could be, if only he was given a second chance, if only somebody extended a helping hand to him, mercy, and restored his sight, so to speak. Helped him to see, you have a life worth living. So we see our own sins, we're honest with them, we make a good confession, every once in a while, periodically. We see Jesus. He is our loving and merciful high priest, as the letter to the Hebrews says. And then we see others the way that he sees us, with love, with compassion. This is the way of following uh, our Lord and our Savior, the new Joshua, out of the past, out of the exile that some of us still live in, the exile, the slavery that's caused by our attachment to things that we think will give us happiness, but really don't. We follow the new Joshua, Jesus Christ, and he will lead us, for sure, out of that exile into the promised land.